I'm Zivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for listening to my podcast. If you like what you hear, please follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books and sign up for my mailing list at zibbyowens.com where I'll always keep you updated on what I'm up to. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy it. I'm happy to be partnering today with this really cool company called Modern Mahjong because I don't know if any of you know people who like to play Mahjong, but I feel like groups of Mahjong playing women are sprouting up everywhere I look. Maybe your mom plays or your grandma or your aunt or your daughter or your college roommate's mom. Somebody plays Mahjong. And if they do, you should go to Modern Mahjong and get them a vintage Mahjong dice set, um, which the the co-founders, Dara and Donna, decided they would put together and start selling when they found a lot of vintage Mahjong sets. And they also are doing lots of fundraisers for Alzheimer's and donate a dollar per pair of purple jokerless Lotus Dot dice sold. Check out Modern Mahjong and give a set. Why not? I'm here today with Lynn and Valerie Constantine. They are the duo behind the pen name Liv Constantine. Their debut thriller, The Last Mrs. Parrish, was a Reese Witherspoon book club selection, a People Magazine Book of the Week, a Target book club selection, and is in development for television. Their second book, The Last Time I Saw You, was published by HarperCollins and is also in development for film. Now they've just released The Wife Stalker, and I'll tell you a little bit about each one of them. So Lynn Constantine is an internationally best-selling author who writes conspiracy thrillers under the pen name L.C. Shaw, and also, of course, psychological thrillers with her sister under the pen name Liv Constantine. You following me still? I hope so. Lynn is a former marketing executive and has a master's degree in business from Johns Hopkins University. She lives with her family and two large dogs in Connecticut. Valerie has a degree in English literature. Early in her career, she ser- she served as a White House assistant in the president's scheduling in advance office, planning presidential trips and travel, and has visited over 40 foreign countries. She has a degree in English literature, which I already said, so ignore that. And she currently lives in Maryland with her husband. So welcome to everybody for coming on <laughs> Moms and Dying to Read Books, all your different names and yeah, pen yeah. names and whatever. So I'm here with Lynn and Valerie Constantine, known together as Liv Constantine, who wrote The Wife Stalker. So welcome, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. It's great to be here. Let's start with this pen name situation. Okay. Go. Right. With the pen name situation, when Lynn and I, Lynn and I actually wrote a book quite a while ago together, and we used our real names. Well, of course, our maiden names, Constantine, Lynn Constantine, and Valerie Constantine. When we got the publishing contract with HarperCollins for The Last Mrs. Parish, we went to lunch with our agent and with the editor. And that was to, and one of the things that we talked about that day was what were we going to do in terms of names for the book. And so, of course, the first thing we said was, well, we, we want it to be Valerie Constantine and Lynn Constantine. And they said, mm, no, that'll just take up too much room on the cover. We don't think so. Uh, and they were worried about, sometimes it could be off-putting to readers to see two names on a book, you know, that they just felt like a lot of times it, it, it looked better and less confusion to have, to have one, one name. name. Yeah. So then we said, well, why don't we just use our initials? We'll, we'll make it LV, L for Lynn, V for mm-hmm. Valerie, LV Constantine. And one of them said, hmm, there's <laughs> <laughs> initial fatigue. There's initial fatigue. <laughs> right, which there which, was when you think oh about it. What a great expression, right? right? Whoever heard I have not heard that fatigue. expression. Right, yeah. right. But there were all of those for a long time. There were all and of those initials. And they come back, Right, and too. then it stopped a bit. So. Yeah. So we kind of looked at each other, and I said, well, why don't we just take those two initials and we'll put a vowel in between them? How about, like, live? And they both said, oh, great. Yeah, I, well, we, we all sort of that. looked at yeah, it, right, yeah, yeah. And, we, and we liked it. And yeah. then, yeah. So that's how live came about. I, I'll let you talk about your other name that you hide behind. Yeah. Oh, right, right. right. It could be that we're in the witness protection program. I'm wondering, I'm wondering what's going on. But we can't really say. So then when I decided that I wanted to write this conspiracy thriller series, which is quite different from what Valerie and I write because we write psychological thrillers, and we talked about names for that. And, 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 And I agree when they said Lynn Constantine is so similar to Liv Constantine that, you know, it's the worry was that if people picked up the network book they would think it was another psychological thriller and be disappointed because, you know, you want to give readers, obviously, what they're expecting. So then I was going to use my dog's name. Oh, my Grayson. gosh. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe Grayson. 
And then Parker. Shaw, and then Parker. Yeah, then the I had another dog. dog, and I thought he would be upset. So <laughs> then I was going to go by. Oh, then they said, why don't we do initials? So the initial fatigue was over. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> right. I, so yeah. it's Lynn. Elsie is for Lynn Constantine, and Shaw is a, an abbreviation of Open Shaw, which is my married name. So, wow. Yes. Right. So that's how that came about. Elsie so we Shaw. still have lots why? of options for other names yes, for exactly. other places. Not to keep talking about this, but <laughs> why wouldn't you just be Lynn Open Shaw? It just didn't sound that yeah. exciting. I don't know. Even my husband's like, oh, don't use open Shaw. Shaw sounds better. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. right. Okay. Whatever. Right. Well, it's right. working. Yes. Whatever yes. is going really on, cool the marketing is right. working. Yeah. Right. I think the pen names right. are fantastic. Yes. <laughs> but I don't know. You just don't hear about pen names as often as I feel like in the past. No, you're right. I mean, my husband jokes and, and says, I don't know who I'm sleeping with tonight. Like, <laughs> who are you? Like, who are you? That so. would be pretty exciting exactly. for him, though. <laughs> so what is the Wife Stalker about? So the Wife Stalker takes place in Westport, Connecticut, and it is about a woman whose husband is just coming out of, of a deep depression that has affected their marriage. And she thinks that it's because he is getting healthy, but what she doesn't realize until it's too late, it's that it's the woman running the retreat and health center that's making his spirits perk. And they have two small children. And so when he leaves her for Piper, she begins to look into Piper's background and is horrified to discover a wake of dead husbands in Piper's past. And is, you know, so she has to try to save her family before it's too late. I am never letting my husband go to a yoga <laughs> retreat. Uh, <ever. laughs> so let's just back up before we started changing all of your names to when you even began writing and what made you start writing and why these two different types of books, the psychological thrillers and the other. Oh, sure. So we've always been big readers, and Val and I are 13 years apart. So we didn't really grow up necessarily together. I mean, we did, but, you know, we were in different Different stages, generations, generations. Yeah. But when same, I be- same parents, same parents. Same parents. We have mm-hmm. two brothers in between. Okay. So then, when I became a teenager, is really when we got close. And we and my mother and her sister, we all used to read the same book. We'd go to the library and pick a book out, and we would talk about it. And we were reading a lot of ethnic fiction at the time, a lot of stories, you know, Chinese, Italian, Irish, Jewish, Jewish. Yeah. And so later, and I guess I was in my twenties at that point, maybe, and you were in your thirties when we wrote Circle Dance. Mm-hmm. Um, I, we were talking. We said, you know, there are no books about Greek families. And we, you know, we wanted, neither of us are married to Greeks. And so we knew our children really were not going to have the same experience we had growing up. And our and our grandmother was gone at that point. All of point. our grandparents were from right, Greece. from Greece. So we, and so that we said, let's, well, then let's write it. So I went and bought a book called How to Write and sell your first novel. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Lynn buys how-to books on everything. everything. Any problem, I'm like, okay, let me yes, get Amazon. If, it wasn't Amazon then, probably, right. but... And um, so we I read the book, and we began writing. We were working, and we would get together once a week. And there was no at night. internet or email at that point. So, you know, we'd print our pages and go over them weekly. And then I think after about a, a half a year, six months, we said, let's just take a week off from work. And Valerie brought her huge desktop over to my house. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> put it on, you know, and we worked and worked, and we and we finished it. And we thought we were going to be on Oprah, and it was going to, you know, like because we would be <laughs> everywhere, right. right? And so we got a, we eventually got a small publisher, a Greek publisher, and it was came out in two thousand, right? I think so, because I think my kids, two thousand, right when I had my twins, okay. and right, and then we, and then I moved to Connecticut, and so. At and that what, point, what were your day jobs at that point? I was working in banking, so I was a, a vice president of marketing for. I was with Citibank, and then I ended up with a couple other banks. And you were with, and, and I was working for. I was working in ministry for yeah. a large church. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So then I moved, and we did a little bit of marketing with it, and, and we just kind of. I, I homeschooled my kids for five years, and so that took all my creative energy. I really had none left at that point, and so it was, I guess. What are we in? I don't even, I never know what year we're in because we're always ahead with the we're, books. We're, we're in 2020. We're 2020. 20. Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. it was about 2014, I went to Thriller Fest. And my kids were back at school, they were in school at that point. And I decided that I wanted to finish the thriller I had begun, which was the network that is now out. And so I told Valerie about it and I told her, you've got to come. I got very insp- inspired at Thriller Fest, just meeting other writers and going to the classes. So I finished my book and Val came with me the next year and said, I think, you know, I'd like to collaborate again. So we began writing together again at that point. Right. And why did you homeschool your kids? Well, (laughs) 
I, I mean, mean, like with the coronavirus looming and the thought my. of the schools closing and having all my kids you here, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, yes, you can. Yeah, um, Lynn had twins. I have right. twins too. Yeah. Oh, okay. You my know? oldest kids are twins. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, we were in Maryland at the time, and, and when I had them, most people were putting kids in private school. So I was in a mom's group, and another woman was telling me she was going to homeschool. And, and so I started looking into it. And I really, what I, my primary reason was I liked the idea of the bonding that you have with your children, of, of them becoming, being more reliant on you in those early years than their peers. Because a lot of the research said what ends up happening is that a five or six-year-old child goes into a classroom of 20. They maybe get 10 minutes of individualized attention from the teacher. So their peers' opinions become really paramount paramount yeah. to them. And so the research showed that a lot of children who were homeschooled at an early age were less impervious to peer pressure mm. when they were older. And so I, I just thought, well, that's, and I wanted to give them a classical education. I wanted to do more living books and that sort of thing. So so then you bought How to Homeschool Your Kids. I did. I did a lot of, you know, we went through tons of curriculum and, and it was it was great. I mean, there were obviously ups and downs and I don't know about your twins, but mine fought a lot, and mm-hmm. that was the yeah. part, that was the hardest part because it was just. Are your twins the same sex? Or are they different? Boy girl, same, boy girl, same. same. And same I think Lynn, yeah, yeah, sometimes I think that, and they're very mm-hmm. different, and that was hard. So there were just times I was pulling my hair out, like, okay, you've got to get along, and so it, it was it was good. I don't I don't regret it. I don't know. They think I kind of ruined them for math, but they're doing, <laughs> doing okay now. Like they're, the rest of it is good, and they're close now. So it was it was a good time, but it was. It Not was easy. It was, and, it was and very time consuming. It was, and then yeah. my daughter turns out has dyslexia, so that's why we went through a ton of reading. You know, so then that was what happened is she needed to go to school, and then he was by himself, and he wanted to go, and so now we're both in college now. Yeah, so I'm doing well. Yes. Wow. And now you're a smash hit author, <laughs> so it all it all worked right. out great. Uh-huh. So how do you two come up with the ideas for all your books? That is one of the most fun parts, don't mm-hmm. you think? We, and usually we're traveling when that happens, or that's just the way it's happened. And maybe because that's the time that we're together and it's just the two of us. We're not, it's Lynn isn't at my house with family around or I'm not at hers. So just Lynn and me and, 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 wine. That, <laughs> yeah, that and a couple glasses of wine. And so we just start talking about maybe, a, you know, a common circumstance or something that it is a very, you know, that happens all of the time. And then well, how could we how could we change that or turn that on its head and it it really evolves over months and it's usually we usually talk about the next book when we're at the very end of the book we're working on we we started last night to yeah. to talk about the next book and we're right we're heavily in the midst of book number 4 and it was really difficult we just couldn't because we were so our heads are so in this place right now, and we couldn't go to the next place. I mean, and sometimes it's organic. It's not always sitting down to say, like, for the last Mrs. Parrish, mm-hmm. I happened to be visiting Val at the time, and we had written another book that we put in the drawer before Mrs. Parrish. And we were just talking about these women who target rich men for the sole purpose, not because they fall in love with them, but because they want the lifestyle. And 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 we were saying— gosh, wouldn't it be nice if instead of it turning out the way they wanted, this happened? And we looked at each other and said, that's what we have to write. So we knew the twist from the beginning with that one. And then the next book that we wrote, the twist changed. Actually, the killer changed in our book on a second or third round. So it's different every time. And I think our process has evolved as well. So, you know, we used to be more strict about assignments, but now I might be writing and then I'll say, ugh. All right, I'm bored of this, and I'll email and say, you want to finish this, finish this chapter? And she'll do right. so, and, yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. So it, it's become a lot, a lot more, easier. Yeah, a lot more collaborative, I think. Definitely, I yeah. I'm always so impressed. How do you get your, your writing style to be, like, how does it come together so perfectly? You can't Isn't tell that, that when one really, starts. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing, actually. It is. Yeah. I mean, we must have similar writing styles at, at some level, but I think when, when Lynn said she'll be, she'll begin writing a chapter mm-hmm. and I might end it or vice versa, and so our writing is completely Im- in, interspersed yeah. with each other's. And then when we edit, we, right. that really brings a whole other level to it that ma- makes it mesh even it's more. It's like you're both perfect ghostwriters too, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. You yeah. Have that same I think skill that's set true. Yeah. You can, yeah. Emulate someone else's voice. Or yes. 
Right, because yeah. you have to both somehow f- find a middle ground or something. It's No, it's yeah. true. And it's funny because when we're in the middle of a project, too, we even begin to think alike. So e- to the p- <laughs> crazy things, we'll try to come up with a character name and sometimes we'll the same thing or an idea. And we'll say, well, we think they should be, and we'll both say twins at the same time. <laughs> okay, well, that, so it's it's like it a little really, yeah, magical. Do you sometimes. ever fight over anything? I mean— not really. I mean, we a couple times we've had disagreements. We've had disagreements. We definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's gotten better because we, instead of having a set opinion, we we bring things to the table and say, all right, let's discuss. What if this? What if that? So it's not like, well, I think it should be such and such. But we've had a couple times when we, mm-hmm. we and then we would take it to our editor. We don't mm-hmm. say whose opinion is whose, yeah, no, right? Yeah, 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 we just which, say which. Right. And then you know we hope. neutral third party right. yeah. key. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then we hope that each of our you know we win. But right. not- <laughs> <laughs> and what was it like when you got when Last Mrs. Parrish got picked as a Reese's Book Club pick? Amazing. Right. Tell me the just, moment you found out. Amazing. Like, tell me, take me through the whole. Just, you can do. It. You okay, can so go. we were we were touring, and it was November, I think. I can't remember October. November. Uh, anyway, we were November. we were in Annapolis at a book club, and I got an, a phone call from our agent, and she said, "Do you and Valerie have some time to talk to Emily? Emily is our at our editor." And I was like, are we in trouble? What's good? She's like, oh, no, no, everything, yes, everything is fine. So she said, all right, call me. So we went back to Valerie's house, and her husband was sitting there. We're around the kitchen table, and, and we were on a landline. We each were on one. So they said, are you sitting down? So we said, yes. <laughs> and they said, you know, you've been, we've been picked for Reese Witherspoon. So, of it's course, December. we were like, what? you know, <laughs> screams of, of joy. And, our, and her husband is looking at us like, what, what? So then they said, but listen, you can't tell Anyone? Oh no! <laughs> there was like two weeks between. We had or two like, weeks or, lead time or before more than it was that, I think to, it was like a month because they didn't come out to the middle. Yeah, they said because you know they don't want anybody to know, and you can't even tell your husbands. And don't even Google her. Don't right. Her. <laughs> so, Colin, my brother-in-law, is a doll, but he's very loose-lipped. He so cannot keep he can't keep it. Your husband? Yes, yes. my husband. Yes. So we hang up the phone, and he says, "What? What?" <laughs> And I was like, oh, they're going to do an article about us. And then he just looked at us like, okay. <laughs> that, you know, that, excited you gotta, about, yeah. right. So it was it was really exciting, but we were, I mean, we were bursting, but we couldn't, we couldn't, couldn't wait to anyone. share it or tell right. anybody, you know. So every day we were waiting for the for the sign and then for the announcement. For the announcement and then, you know. But so. it was amazing. We were, it was thrilling. And absolutely shocking. Thrilling. I mean, we had no, yeah, yes, no expectation or no, you know, no idea that that was even a possibility right. you know, for the book or whatever. So it was, I mean, to see, and then she, um, <laughs> I was just getting to know how to do Instagram. And so she shared, she did a story. And so I said to my daughter, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, she's like, well, you have to like it, mom. Mm-hmm. And, you know, send her a message, which I did. And she wrote back to me. And then I was like, so starstruck, like a <laughs> yeah. teenager. I'm like, okay, what do I answer? She's like, do a little hard and do this. <laughs> so, yeah, it was really And exciting. did you ever meet her? We did not. We did not. She was, you know, it was close to Christmas. So they said she, she didn't have time, but maybe one day. I don't know. We love her. So, you know, Aww. she's, yeah, yeah. we're yeah. grateful. And what happened after and I'll stop talking. I want to talk more about the book. But mm-hmm. when you become Maurice's book pick, they ask you to put the little logo on your book? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. So it has the seal. And now Barnes & Noble has all I of that. I saw that. Which is wonderful. Yeah, they it's have really the table. Yeah. Yes, I yeah, took a picture of that. I have to post that. Yeah, that yeah. was yeah, really neat. That's, yeah, that's so wonderful. Yeah, so wonderful. They've been great. I mean, and they so we're part been. of the Hello Sunshine family, which we're, I mean, it's it's just a huge honor. And it we, is. We absolutely. love them. And then isn't, aren't your books in the process of being developed, one for film and one? There's yes, yes. Mrs. Parrish is with in development with Amazon. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we just wait for news for that. It, it, yeah. it, it takes it forever. Takes a while, it takes right? really long. And then we have um we're we have an option for the last time I saw you for film, which mm-hmm. again can't make an announcement, but there is an actor an actress attached, attached, attached to, to that. Mm-hmm. And then hopefully something will happen with the wife stalker. Right. right? So let's talk about the wife stalker, which was really great. Did you come up with this? I was wondering because the villain question mark in the book (laughs) is this like size two yoga aficionado wellness center woman. And I wonder, did they see a woman like this and wonder like what was going on? (laughs) Like what's her backstory? (laughs) Did that start anything or did I just make that up? Like how did... You made that up, but that's kind of a good story. It if is. We want to go forward, but yeah. no, no, I don't think so. It, we came. Mm. It's difficult to talk about it without sort of the doing twist, it a, right. Yeah. The, when we were discussing about we, and we don't intentionally. I don't think, but maybe we do. It seems like all our books have two female protagonists. You know, it's not. It just has 
ended mm-hmm. up that way, mm-hmm. although the next one doesn't. So right. we'll break okay. in the, yeah. But when we were talking, we actually made, Valerie made a joke. I said, well, what if she's, and she said something, and then we said, mm-hmm. oh, you know what, maybe that right. would work. And that's what we ended up, so, so then we said, well, how would, how would we do that? And that's, you know, how it went along. Um, you know, I think we've all known the Pipers, right? Those beautiful, you know, they were the cheerleaders in yeah, school. Yeah, you know, they I mean, the, the, right. right. They're, they, yeah, they're like the perfect people, and they're happy, and they're nice, and they're right. and it's sort of like, wow, how did you? Yeah. How did you get all of that? Yeah. That's really right, but nobody's really perfect, right? So then, right. you know, that's looking behind. And we certainly don't uh, mean anything mean toward yoga instructors. Absolutely, no, right. no, not at all. No, no. I mean, I'd love to be a yoga instructor. Yeah, yeah I would too. Yeah. And then you contrast her a bit with Joanna, who's Leo's wife and the mother of right. kids, and blah blah blah. And then Joanna's dealing with her own issues with her mother, yes. which I found very interesting. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to read this passage because because I feel like this should win the award for the best guilt trip in literature that I've read. <laughs> and I've heard a lot of guilt trips in real life and everything. So this one, like, took the cake. So Joanna's mother breaks her leg and needs lots of help at home. And she says, I took, she, so Joanna says, like, no, I have to get home to my kids soon. And her mother's not having it. She's like, I took care of you for your whole life. And you can't sacrifice a, f- a few weeks of yours for me. You care more about that hotshot lawyer than your mother. The children have sitters and their father. They'll be fine. And she says, fine, Joanna, abandon your mother. Just remember that I gave up my career for you. I stayed home with you when you had mono. Remember, for six months, I couldn't work. And they gave my promotion to someone else. Who knows what direction my life would have taken if I'd been made a manager at my company. Instead, I lost lost my job. Your father <laughs> left us for that woman and her daughter, and I took care of you after he was gone, even though you were already 18. I could have kicked you out like a lot of parents do when their kids come of age. And then Joanna throws up her hands and just says, okay, I'll stay. I'll stay. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. All right, where does this come from? How, what, is your guilt mom trip. like this? Or are you, where are these guilt trips? Do you give these guilt, do you give these guilt trips? <laughs> Our mom was wonderful, but she could do it. She could pull a guilt trip occasionally. She could. Definitely. And our grandmother, for sure. Or a grandmother. She was a yeah. great guilt tripper. I'm highly susceptible to, to be guilted into things. Yeah, and our children, actually. as we all know as mothers, you know, they, they can do the guilt trip. They'll wrap it around in something they need that's really, mm-hmm. like, critical to their totally. survival and their well-being yeah. if you don't do it. Right? Yeah. And then I think our set, like, ourselves, I guilt trip myself that, right? Do don't that we all too. do that? Yeah. Like, not being yeah. a good enough mom or not being a good enough daughter. All, so, yeah. and being Greek, the guilt. <laughs> the guilt. That's just right. that just comes with the territory. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> I also found it interesting. Leo, the lawyer, the hotshot lawyer, just discussed Joanna's husband. In the beginning, had had been battling depression, and I found it interesting the way you sort of treated that, and the way Joanna treated it, sort of with kid gloves, almost like right. you've had this. So, mm-hmm. did you do research on this, or how did you come up with that element of his backstory? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a good friend who is a clinical psychologist, so she, I always talk to her about— We her, use her a lot. Right, you actually, know, kind yeah. of run things by her. And, I've known, you know, known you, people with you depression. You could do a, a triple pen name. Get yes, her exactly. Name in there too, right? Right. Yes, right. Yes, yes. Sorry, she's gone. definitely in the—she's <laughs> always in the acknowledgments, uh, Carmen. Is she? And um, so, you know, we do run things by her, and we always—we read a lot about whatever mm-hmm. personality disorder— not that that's a d- disorder, but in other books, yeah. or, you know, any kind of thing, mental health issue— right. You know, to try to know we about do, it. Yeah, yeah, we do research on that for sure. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> There's a quote in the book referring to marriage, and it says, It's not magic, it's love. It's believing in the power of love and the powers of our years together. How much credit should we give to the past when we're debating on the future, right? Everybody who has been married has all this past. When does the past become like in the past versus? When can it stop affecting your decisions about whether or not to go forward? What do you think? I mean, I think weighing everything. I guess, you know, obviously if someone's in an abusive relationship or something that's harmful, then it doesn't, I I mean, I don't care how many years you have together. You have to look at how that's affecting now. But I think also depending upon if it's a transitional thing, right? We all go through our ups and downs in all of our relationships. So if you can stick it out, if it's something that can be worked through, and I think if you have a lot of good years together— it's worth it because no matter what, you're going to get into a new relationship. You're going to be faced with problems in that relationship as well, right? I think so. that's true. I think, but then I think there's also the this the situation where maybe the past and what you've been going through is not a good thing, 
And right. but it's there's such a fear often of leaving mm-hmm. something that you know and something that feels familiar, even though it's painful, and moving into the unknown. And then what a lot of psychologists would say is that you you really won't leave a situation that's painful until it's it's so painful that the fear of the unknown seems less painful Absolutely. to you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that can be a really difficult thing for people who are in, in a bad marriage, in a bad relationship, or even with family that might be toxic or where they were in abusive situations. Because we, we do tend to want to stay in what's familiar and what we know mm-hmm. and what feels safe, even though it's not safe, because out there is scary. It's true, even in a job, anything, right? Right. Like whatever seems. Yeah. But and, and I think too, there's a tendency to not want to make the wrong, quote mm-hmm. unquote, wrong decision, yeah. right? As opposed mm-hmm. to saying, well, you know, it's not necessarily right or wrong. It's just different. Right. And the only mm-hmm. way to know is to try. But there is there. It, it, I definitely think fear can, you know, it can really stop. You it can anyway. stop you at times. So. Did you read a book called How to Write a Psychological Thriller? <laughs> no. We didn't know we were writing a psychological we, when thriller, we were married, actually. We, we thought it was yeah, just a, We thought it was women's fiction. Yeah. I mean, when that's what we intended it mm-hmm. as, women's fiction. And when we got an agent and we signed our contract and she said, you know, this is a psychological thriller. And we said, really? That's, yeah, she yeah. said it sort of goes over. The nice thing, it's both. And so we did. Because as you, you know, with Parrish, there's no murder in Parrish. But then... We graduated to murder in the next. Started killing people. Started killing people. Yeah, got to work towards something. Well, maybe you can write a little thing called How to Write a Psychological Thriller. You can add your two genres since you're so familiar with it. Right. Maybe like a little giveaway on your website. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. People sign up for your mailing list. (laughs) I'll just stop with (laughs) that. Anyway, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Lots of advice for, yeah. Lots of reading, 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 and reading classics I would I, in addition to modern you know fiction and whatever but I think reading the classics is always helpful and I think ta- I mean really studying the craft for 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 me I remember when I first started I was worried about taking any writing classes because you think you know naively assume oh that's going to change my voice or yeah. but it's really important I learned I worked in Westport with a small group called Write Yourself Free and Patrick this man Patrick McCord who was amazing and he for two years, I attended workshops mm-hmm. where there were only eight of us, and you'd bring your writing in, and they didn't critique, because I think that sometimes that can be tough when you have other people that are mm-hmm. just as green as you are. But he would give good advice, and I really learned how to embody, or I hope so anyway, my writing through through those workshops. And then attending Thriller Fest, again, there's all the craft classes. And it, you know, you're know, you going to find some advice that you agree with and some that you don't, but I think continuing to write, practicing, having a good mentor. And we've learned a ton, too. We have an amazing editor at HarperCollins, and we have learned so much working with her over the years, just each book. You know, you think that you're, and as a new writer, I think a lot of times they're finished and, they, and they're submitting, and they don't know what they don't know. Because I know that was the case for mm-hmm. us. You know, so the other thing is when, if you can, to find a good editor before you try to find an agent to just take it that next step can really make yeah, the difference. To go to the next yeah. level, definitely. I think a lot of time, often people think of editors as the ones who go in and they fix punctuation and they maybe change a word here or there or they fix spelling, but there's so much more to the editing process where they'll talk about story development and why maybe this should be placed instead of being in the first third of the book, maybe this should be in halfway through because that will mm-hmm. make the that will increase the tension. Or what is this person thinking when he says that? You know, I want I'd like to know what the emotions are and why what, what does she think when he says blah 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 back to her? And so now when we're writing when <laughs> in fact when I was reading one of Lynn's chapters and I wrote why did she, you know, because so we, so the editor is like constantly in our head too. But that, I, I think hiring a freelance editor for Mrs. Parrish was incredibly helpful for us before we mm. submitted it. It was. I mean, we actually hired her just to do a, a quick line edit just mm-hmm. before we did. And she, and she, she's terrific too. And we've worked with her on other books and she just pointed out one thing that she felt cut the tension in the middle of the book. Mm. And we, over the course of an hour, we said, all right, we talked about it. We said, well, what if we just stopped it here and moved this over here so the reader doesn't know what happens until, and which is what we did. And, and I really wonder if we hadn't done that, 
if it would have been picked up, mm -hmm. you know, okay. as quickly as it was. So, but we couldn't, you know, you're so close, you can't see it. So that's the other thing. The editor can see things that are just make those little things that are really aren't little mm -hmm. things. And I would also say just keep persevering. Uh, yeah, that's Do huge. it every day. Don't give up. If that's really your dream, just keep doing it and doing it. And if you feel like you're stuck on something, put it away. Put it in the drawer. Mm -hmm. And start as, new. And start something new. And also get a book called Rotten Rejections and read the I think rejections. it might be out of print, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> you can even find yeah. it online. Yeah. The rejections that amazing classics and bestsellers got to just... You do have to have a thick skin. I think Jonathan, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, someone wrote and said, you know, no one wants to read about birds. I mean, they're just all in animal things, right? form. Nobody yeah. wants to read that, about animals yeah. anymore. And that, I mean, no, obviously they didn't right. read the yes. books. So. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you both so much oh, for coming you. on. Thanks for braving yeah. the traffic to get here and schlepping all the way in to do this in person. I really Our appreciate pleasure. it. Oh, no, absolutely. We're, we're happy to. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks again for listening to my podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you liked this episode, please follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books and sign up for my mailing list at ZibbyOwens.com so you can always hear about the latest things I'm up to. Thanks a lot. Thanks to Modern Mahjong for partnering with us today. Modern Mahjong. We will think of you anytime we need to give a gift to a Mahjong playing person. Thanks so much. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. Mm -hmm.